What does the Denver Broncos defensive line depth look like going into training camp? We continue our Denver Broncos training camp position previews with that position in mind specifically. You get that and much more on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome into a brand new episode of Locked On Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much to everybody in Broncos country for tuning in, making us your first listen of the day every single day. Make sure you subscribe or follow for free wherever you get your podcasts or available on YouTube. We have you covered every single day, all year long, for all the Broncos news, content coverage, analysis, and more that you need in Broncos country. I'm your host, as always, Cody Rourke. Broncos reporter from Mile High Sports. Join alongside, as always, by my co-host, Sarah Bettinger, site expert, predominantly orange.com. This episode of Lockdown Broncos is brought to you by eBay Motors. A championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. Same with your vehicle. So for parts that fit, head to eBay Motors and look for the green check. Stay in the game with eBay Guaranteed Fit. eBayMotors.com. Let's ride. eBay Guaranteed Fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items. Only exclusions apply. Sarah. We are here, the finish line of our position previews for the Denver Broncos. We're focusing on the defensive line here. A lot of questions, right? Defensive end, defensive tackle. A lot of questions about maybe some young guys coming up. Can they take the next step in their development? And I'm excited to break it all down because obviously before we did this, there were some new storylines that presented itself with Mike Purcell, obviously over the weekend being placed on the non-football injury list. So how does this shake things up? I'm excited to break it all down, my man. Yeah, me too, Cody. Really, the Mike Purcell news does a little bit of uh, damage to this group's appearance from the outside looking in, at least in my opinion it does. I know not everybody sees the value of what Purcell brings to the table, but I think you and I are in agreement here that he does quite a bit. I mean, the box score doesn't always reflect the way that Mike Purcell affects and impacts games, but he certainly does. And really, even before the news of him going on the non-football injury list, which is not injured reserve by any means, and it's it's probably not even as serious as the PUP. Like, he can come off at any point, but it kind of just enhances the idea in my mind, Cody, that the Broncos may need another veteran to raise the floor of this room, as we talked about with the edge position. But more about that a little bit later on. Let's talk about the guys that are actually on this roster. The Broncos do have multiple high-priced free agents on the defensive line, namely, obviously, Zach Allen coming in this year from the Arizona Cardinals and DJ Jones last year from the San Francisco 49ers. So a couple former NFC West guys joining the Denver Broncos the last couple of years, really making that group, I would say, legitimate. Those are the two guys at the top of the depth chart. And everything else, Beyond Mike Purcell, who we already touched on, there's a lot of, like you said, question marks. So what ifs? Matt Henningsen, he played quite a bit as a rookie, but can he handle an expanded role in year two? Yoma Uwazurike, same question for him, although we didn't see as much of him last season. Jonathan Harris, he's kind of been one of those guys the scouting department seems to like. He's done pretty solid when he's gotten opportunities. We'll see what happens there. Elijah Garcia, from the formerly of the Los Angeles Rams. He's another factor in the mix there. And then you've got guys that got brought in this offseason. Tyler Lancaster is obviously a player who's played quite a bit in the NFL. Again, not showing up a ton on the box score, but he's played quite a bit. P.J. Mustafer, the undrafted rookie, he's intriguing at the very least. Jordan Jackson, a former sixth-round pick of the Saints, he comes in as a reserve future player. And then Haggai and Debuisi, Cody, he is the international exemption for this Broncos roster. So if at any point you see the Broncos have 91 players or you see him out, out there, he is that guy that's got that exemption to be out there. He's in the international player program. So a lot of bodies on the defensive line, but it doesn't necessarily mean there's a lot of certainty at that position group. And into we see as well. I mean, as you mentioned there, the exemption for those that are wondering what that means, it does it means that he doesn't count toward their 90 man roster, which I think is a good kind of flex balance to have there. And hey, he's gonna have every opportunity here in training camp in the preseason to maybe make some noise and maybe make a you know a push for a roster move here for the Broncos. But as we're talking right now, usually I think defensive line is so important. And I'll say, like, the one observation I had of this entire group 
during OTAs, during mandatory minicamp, they actually have some pretty good size to them now. But here's also the kicker in terms of maybe how the evaluation process will begin, especially for fans that plan on being in attendance in Friday's practice and all, you know, throughout training camp, if you're going to be there, here's what I want you to watch specifically. And we're going to keep our eye on it as well. It seems like the defensive line, it doesn't matter, you know, necessarily what your designation is as a D end or D tackle. I, the observation I had is that pretty much all of these guys need to be able to play both defensive tackle, defensive end under Marcus Dixon inside this defensive scheme, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, to be honest with you, Sarah, I think it amplifies a little bit of the ceiling there because if you have a guy who can plug against the run solidly, right, and, and can play an anchor down as a defensive tackle, whether he's playing a one technique or a two, a two eye, or even a three, or you have a defensive end that can play maybe the five or the four eye or something, like even, a, even a three in that standpoint. I think having that ability to do a little bit of both, I think, can help maximize your personnel, especially when you play a team like what did what did Denver do last year when they had to take on Derrick Henry? We saw an unorthodox approach where they had three linebackers out there, something they've never normally done. They had Jonas Griffith, Alex Singleton, and Josie Jewell out there to try to stop Derrick Henry. They limited, obviously, him under 60 yards rushing. Unfortunately, still lost the game. It wasn't because of that. And then the defensive line, you have your beef there. So for me, if you're playing a team that loves to run the football, has a big bruiser of a back, which I'm very curious now. I mean, we're all eyeing the Raiders matchup week one with Josh Jacobs. He's been a thorn on the side of the Broncos. Would they have maybe changed the way that they approach that game plan, you know, this upcoming season? We don't know yet. I and mean, it's unlikely he's going to play for them in week one or maybe even play for them this season. We'll talk about that on another day. But I think Denver has a lot of guys at this position right now that have positional flex versatility which is great. So the bigger question will surround who really separates themselves from the pack here going into training camp, going into preseason, because as we're looking at the list in totality, I mean, there's a good, what was it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's like 10, 11 guys there at that position that can play either D tackle, D end. I like that. And I think the bigger thing too is, and the defensive line group, can they stay healthy? We saw last year, the Broncos were negatively impacted by that when injuries did come up especially late in the season, right? We've talked about the team only had three sacks over the final three games, and there's no coincidence that that came after Draymond Jones went down. So you got to have more than one guy that can create pressure from that interior defensive line. And just like we talked about with the interior offensive line, it's often about the more you can do, right? The more you can do, the better chance you've got uh, at getting on the field. If you can win against a center and a guard, and then you could line up face up with an offensive tackle and still make an impact, you could be out on the field for, I mean, 60, 70 percent of the snap. So it's the more you can do. Right. And, and, and that helps everybody. It helps out the schemers. It helps out the linebackers. You need to be able to play and flex, like you said, all over that defensive line. So the Broncos do have a wide variety of guys, different sizes, different shapes, different strengths, different weaknesses. It's all going to be up to, you know, we, we talk a lot about Christian Parker on the show, the defensive backs coach. Marcus Dixon, though, he was the other guy that Sean Payton retained from the previous staff. He's the Broncos defensive line coach, maybe a rising star in the coaching ranks as well. He's got a lot of pressure on him, just as Christian Parker does, to really bring the young guys on this roster along. As of right now, there's not a, another veteran coming, at least as the time of we're recording this. The Broncos could go out and sign somebody after we record it and, and make the, you know, change the whole entire spectrum of the position. But as of right now, Marcus Dixon has a lot of young guys that he's going to be able to mold for this coming season. And that kind of makes this position group, I think, one of the more exciting on the team. Well, a lot of exciting parts that are going to be happening here at defensive line, including various position battles. Which players should Broncos fans keep their eye on specifically in terms of positional depth? We'll dive deep into that, and you'll get that on today's episode, Locked on Broncos. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Sometimes in life, we're faced with tough choices, and the path forward isn't always clear. And whether you're dealing with decisions around career, relationships, or anything else, therapy helps you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate life so that you can move forward with confidence and excitement. And trusting yourself to make decisions that align with your values is like anything. The more you practice it, the easier it gets. I've utilized BetterHelp therapy in the past, last year specifically during the NFL season. My life revolved around traveling quite a bit not getting a lot of sleep. And so for me, it was trying to figure out how do I balance my work? How do I balance life together? 
That's what I went and used BetterHelp online therapy for. And the process is super easy. It's super simple. I went out, I filled out a form. It matched me to a therapist. And luckily my therapist and I, we hit it off really well. But if you do not hit it off well with your therapist on the first try, the first go round, you can change therapists at any time and it won't cost you a single thing to do just that. It's also convenient to where you can do therapy anytime you need to, whether you're on the go, you're on the road, you can make your schedule that fits to your needs specifically with BetterHelp Therapy Online. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Let therapy be your map. With BetterHelp, visit betterhelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on. Well, we're going to talk about some roster locks for the Denver Broncos defensive line in 2023. Maybe a couple of guys battling it out for a starting job, backup positioning, a couple of sleepers at this position as well. And hey, I wonder, will Frank Clark be maybe drifting in and out of the defensive line room? We're going to discuss that. But before we do from Cody and I just want to say thank you to every single one of you that makes Locked On Broncos your first listen of the day every single day, wherever and however you listen to podcasts. If we're joining you in the car on your commute to work or if we're joining you on the treadmill while you're working out, we appreciate you for making us part of your day every single day. Or if you watch us on YouTube, Cody, I, I love watching the shows on YouTube. It's fun to get to see the people com uh, comment and engage with the show and just be part of the live broadcast, right? And just to get to engage with the fans that way. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for subscribing and getting us over that 10,000 subscriber mark. We appreciate you all so much. So as we get closer to the season, really uh, thank you so much for sharing Lockdown Broncos with your friends, your Broncos fan friends out there and just growing this community that we have. So Cody, the defensive line room roster locks at this position group. I struggle with this. I put a couple yeah. question marks in our yeah. show notes by a couple guys because I just don't know how many can you consider roster locks behind Zach Allen behind DJ Jones, there's really not much clarity to me right now, other than obviously Mike Purcell, who's opening camp on the non-football injury list, and even even him. Who knows what what could happen there? So, do you perceive anybody else beyond Zach Allen and DJ Jones as roster locks right now on the D line for the Denver Broncos? It's a great question, and I I also struggled with this thought too. And and ideally, we would say Purcell, right? But even last year, as we talked about, he kind of took one for the team uh, during initial roster cuts because he's a vested veteran and came back. But he's on the final year of his deal here in Denver. After this year, he's going to be a free agent. And I'm glad in like segment one, you had talked about the value that he brings. He's not going to be a guy that's going to create a lot of pressure on opposing quarterbacks playing on the defensive interior at tackle or a defensive end, but. He's going to be one of your best run pluggers, your run stoppers there. And I think the bigger question here is, yeah, like Zach Allen, roster lock, DJ Jones, roster lock. Everything behind them, though, is definitely questionable here. And I think it's fair to kind of speculate. It's, it's kind of wide open. And considering how many guys the Broncos have in total on the defensive line, it makes sense that things are wide open a little bit because you have more options to choose from. And hey, look, now that you have these three preseason games, you don't have to make roster cuts initially till after the third and final one. You can see what you get from all of these guys. But Sarah, what are we looking for here on the defensive line this upcoming season? We talked about pressure, but I also think it's the consistency. We talked about the versatility that all these guys have to be able to play tackle or to be able to play defensive end. To me, it also goes to what we saw the Broncos do last year under a zero ever. Remember all the stunt packages we saw where we'd see the defensive end crash inside and then the outside linebacker would fill his spot or vice versa. The defensive end would go outside and so outside linebacker would come inside. You have more ability to get creative with your stunt packages on the defensive side of the ball. But the question is, who can be reliable? Who can be a force? And I think the biggest thing that we have to see here, DJ Jones brings it to the table. But for the Broncos, do they have guys that can make the initial strike, point of contact against an offensive lineman, shoot the gap and create backfield penetration? Denver needs more of that this upcoming season. And I don't know who that's going to be. You mentioned Matt Henningsen. You mentioned Inyomo Uwazarike. These are guys that Matt Henningsen was a role player last year. Uwazarike became one a little bit later on as the year progressed. Does that take their development to the next level? Are they 
in a position where they can take a step forward or are some other guys like an undrafted rookie free agent like P.J. Mustafa, who the Broncos paid quite a bit of money to sign as an undrafted rookie free agent. Could he maybe step into the mix here and maybe contribute? I I have no idea how it's going to go, but I mean, there are so many guys there. Former New Orleans St. Jordan, Jackson Jr. How is that going to play out here? A lot of question marks here and not a lot of answers right now. So to me, you know, we've talked about other positions here specifically on the Broncos defense at edge rusher about, okay, hey, you have guys, you have numbers there, but where's the proven quality there? To me, that also applies here to the defensive line. I have no idea how it's going to go, but I will throw a question out there to you here. How might Frank Clark potentially factor into the mix? We know Sean Payton said he's an outside linebacker. I think he'd be better off at defensive end here. Could he boost the Broncos defensive line in the event something happens? He definitely could. He's got the body type and the strength to be able to play defensive end. He's 275 pounds, so that he's a big dude out there, and he can play that variety of positions. Like you mentioned, I think you can rely on him to get pressure not only as a stand-up edge rusher, but from a variety of spots on that defensive line. So I think we could see him floating some, depending on the personnel the Broncos keep. But the thing about the Broncos' defensive line that strikes me, Cody, unlike the other position groups on the defense, you have a couple of other things at linebacker, edge, corner, safety. You either have guys that have proven that they can be fixtures for you, like, for example, at cornerback, Damari Mathis. He's proven that he could be a starting caliber cornerback in the NFL, right? At the edge, you have a guy that you invested draft capital in, like Nick Benito. Even though he might be fourth or fifth on the depth chart right now, at least, hey, you invested a second-round pick in the guy. Every other position group has somebody who's shown something like, okay, he could be a, a starter for us, or we invested a starter caliber draft pick in that guy, so we also have to back that up with giving him opportunity and coaching. Who has that on the defensive line right now? Where, where is that coming from? You've got Uazurike, a fourth-round draft pick. It's Ultimately, you're not really relying on those guys to do much, especially when they didn't show a lot year one. Matt Henningsen, a former sixth-round pick, there's not much – there's not much investment attached to any of these guys is what I'm trying to say. Whereas other positions defensively, you have investment attached to, to guys at each spot. Defensive line, you've obviously got those top two free agents, but man, you're going to be playing three or four defensive linemen most of the time. So you've got to have other guys at this position group. This is where I struggle. Yes, we have sleepers like PJ Mustafer and, and Jordan Jackson. Those are the two sleepers that I wrote down for this unit. But at the same time, it's it's just kind of like, okay, are you relying on the sleepers to come through? Are you relying on the day three draft picks from last year to come through? There's just not much proven here that really gives me confidence going into the season. Like you said, what does this unit need? Consistency. Where is that going to come from? And, and I, I think this will be one of the most fascinating position groups to watch, Cody, as you're out there for training camp seeing – Who's with the starting unit? Who's with the second unit? How often are guys rotating in with either or? Because that'll give us a, a great indication of what this coaching staff and scouting department really thinks of the guys currently on the roster. Broncos country, how do you feel about the team's defensive line depth right now? Do you agree with Sarah or myself? Do you have any differing opinions? If you're watching on YouTube, comment it down below. If you're listening, wherever you get your podcast, you can always tweet us on social media, on Twitter. We'll always call it Twitter or threads at Cody Rourke NFL at Sarah Bettinger, at Locked On Broncos. We're going to continue our conversation here as we project what the defensive line will look like, in our opinion, going into the regular season, barring any injuries. You're going to get that on today's episode, Locked On Broncos. Real quick, you make Locked On Broncos your first listen of the day every single day. Well, after this, for your second listen, make sure you go check out the Locked On NFL podcast. There's some big stories going on right now around the NFL as teams are reporting for training camp. There's already been several major injuries to some key players around the NFL. What do the local experts have to say? How does it impact the landscape of their team's outlook for this upcoming season? You're going to get all that on the Locked On NFL podcast, wherever you get your podcasts, or free on YouTube. What does the Denver Broncos defensive line depth look like altogether outside of the starters that we have projected? How many players will they keep on the roster? We'll go through our roster projection at this position on today's episode of Lockdown Broncos. Real quick, just want to say thank you so much to everybody in Broncos country. Thanks for taking time out of your day every single day to listen to us wherever you get your podcasts or to watch us on YouTube, on your smartphone, on your computer, or on your TV before bed. We're super grateful you take time to invest into listening 
to what we have to say. We always aim to bring you objective daily Broncos news, content coverage, analysis, and more without hot takes, without clickbait. We believe in telling Broncos fans what we're seeing at practice, what we're seeing, you know, what we're hearing in the locker room, what we're seeing on the field, because you deserve that information. There's too much smoke and mirrors out there. We hope Lockdown Broncos becomes your daily hub for all things that you need, considering the orange and blue. Sarah, getting into this as well, I think the numbers game, it's always hard to project because as we're doing this, this is our final roster projection. And it's hard to remember off the top of the head how many players we kept at each position, right? So we may reach 53, we may exceed it, but ideally everything is changing. Uh, the positions fluctuate. Injuries could definitely have an impact on other positions, personnel groupings here. For the Broncos defensive line here, how, how do you see it playing out? Like how many players do you think they're going to keep? Obviously, there's the starters, but how many backup guys are they going to keep behind them? I mean, with how many guys are in this room right now for the team, it, this is probably the hardest position room to really project here for the Broncos and all of our training camp previews that we have done. It really is the hardest. And in my opinion, I think we're looking at either five or six, and it all depends on the team's vision. As we've heard Sean Payton say many times, the vision for somebody like Frank Clark, who could float between the defensive line and the edge position. But I'm looking at last year's snap counts for this team, Cody, the, the team leaders on the defensive line for the Denver Broncos in snap count last year. Number one, Draymond Jones. Number two, Deshaun Williams. Number three, DJ Jones. And then after him, Mike Purcell, followed by Matt Henningsen, Jonathan Harris, and Ioma Uwazarike. So right now, you're missing the top two guys on that list, obviously. The fourth guy on that list is on the non-football injury list. So you're looking at you know, really replacing a lot of snaps on the defensive yeah. line. Of course, Zach Allen going to do a lot of that. But who takes Deshaun Williams' spot is really – Maybe the main question here, because he was a huge part of the rotation last year. I just don't know who that's going to be. I'm penciled in, obviously, Matt Henningsen, who played quite a bit last year as a rookie, and Ioma Uazurike in those spots there behind Zach Allen, DJ Jones, Mike Purcell, assuming he's healthy by the end of training camp, right? So that would give you five guys, and I think there's a spot for a sixth, maybe a free agent like could a reunion with Shelby Harris be in the cards? Who knows? We'll see what happens as camp approaches. But just kind of feel like it's an unsettled five, maybe six guys in this unit. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And, and as you're reading off the snap count percentages, and I was thinking about like Draymond coming in at number one despite missing four games last year. Crazy, mm -hmm. crazy to think about. Deshaun obviously was another guy that started opposite of of him last year. He's now with the Carolina Panthers and. You really need guys to step up. So for me, I'd be curious as well, because even Zach Allen missed four games last year. I'm curious to see how many total snaps he played. Was it as much as Draymond? Was it less? Was it more? I mean, that's also something to throw out there. You mentioned Purcell. That is a little concerning as well, considering he's on the NFI list, which I, I think, as you mentioned, we, we talked about it earlier. You can come off that and you can come off PUP at any time. But NFI is probably not as concerning as being on the PUP. It's a little different. Usually we see guys on the NFI list activated pretty early throughout training camp. Uh, on top of that, I mean, yeah, can Inyomo Wazarike or Matt Henningsen, what has their development looked like from a, a weight room perspective, you know, from a football perspective? Having a year played in the NFL is a great experience. What did they learn from that last year? How do they carry it over here into year two? What changes from the coaching side? Obviously, Marcus Dixon, as you mentioned, coming back, but with a Vance Joseph, a new defensive coordinator there, what changes in terms of what you've been taught previously in terms of terminology and how you carry it over? Are you picking up the playbook? I mean, there are so many variables here that could impact this position. It truly is wide open here for the taking for the Broncos on the defensive line. I, I do like that you mentioned Shelby Harris here a little bit, right? Because I think for where Denver is at, and even if they do, if they suffer an injury at all during training camp, which look, we've seen it around the NFL already. Several teams have had some key players go down. This is my hope. I, I hope that everybody else can stay healthy, not just on the Broncos, but for all other NFL teams. It's always a brutal time of the year to read about somebody getting injured during a practice or suffering a non-contact injury. It just stinks. It sucks in, in totality. For the Broncos, can they avoid that this year? Shelby Harris has not yet been picked up by any NFL team as of the time that we're recording this. And as time progresses, and look, Here's the challenge. Shelby has not been at an OTA. He's not, he's not been part of an off-season program. He's had to do all the lifting and, and all the training on his own to try to stay ready. 
is that call going to come? I think there's a distinct possibility, especially let's say Purcell isn't ready to come back yet or there is something that prolongs it. I could see Denver picking up the phone and calling Shelby, but then again, maybe they want to see what they have out of these young guys here. I think it's a different 10 year now. Now that a guy like Sean Payton is in the building, I think it changes everything drastically. It does, and it it really is going to come down to, as I, I know I read Mike Kliss, he wrote an article over the weekend, Cody, about nine storylines to follow. One of them was the relationship between Sean Payton and the general manager, George Payton, as well. Remember, this is a new era under Sean Payton, and we've seen he does have final say over the roster, but at the same time, remember George Payton signed Shelby to the three-year contract and really gave him that long-term deal in Denver before, you know, kind of being forced to include either him or Draymond Jones in the Russell Wilson trade with the Seahawks. So it's going to be, I'm not necessarily saying there's a battle that could happen there, but it could be, you know, George Payton saying, Hey, look, we see the roster this way in the front office and you guys are seeing it this way on the field. We think this guy can help us. You say bank on the young guys. What happens if we don't sign this guy and the young guys don't pan out? Those are the tough questions you have at the beginning of training camp because the last thing you want to do is really be reactionary. At least in my mind, I would I would hate if I was a GM or a coach to have to be reactionary this time of year as opposed to saying, hey, Shelby Harris is out there. We could get him for a couple million. We could bring him in, fortify our depth. And then you don't do it. And then all of a sudden you end up needing it week, week three, week four. You got to make moves in training camp that are going to impact your roster down the line. So that's where I think this kind of becomes a tough discussion between those two guys and their relationship really being one of trust. So whether it is banking on the young guys or whether it is going after the veteran free agent, these guys are really going to have to show a lot of trust in each other the further we get into training camp because those big name free agents, they're going to start flying off the board again. Well, it'll also be very big for Broncos country to see how the dynamic works out. I mean, so far, Sean Payton, George Payton, their relationship has been great in terms of the collaboration process free agency, the NFL draft. How does that change or what like ripples come through when there is like a pressing need to make a move here? And I, I know a lot of it, Sarah, I'm glad you brought up reactionary versus, you know, being proactive, looking ahead and saying, okay, hey, we're going to do this just as, as a contingency plan. I'm curious to see what John Payton, George Payton, I would love to know what they think about the defensive line depth right now. That might be something we ask on day one of Broncos camp when we meet with Payton at the podium. Broncos country, thank you so much for tuning into today's episode of the show. That'll wrap up Lock on Broncos here today. We have one final episode before the start of training camp officially in Broncos country. We want to hear from you. Send in it, whether you're watching on YouTube, stay tuned for the tweet that I'll post with Sarah and myself and the Locked on Broncos Twitter handle, where we're going to ask you, the avid listeners of Broncos country, what are some things that you want to have answered during Broncos camp? What are some things that you'd like to see? You can comment on YouTube, you can share it on Twitter, and we'll get you involved on the show as well as Broncos training camp kicks off officially on Friday, July 28th at the Centura Health Training Center, 10 o'clock a.m. kickoff. We're excited. We'll break down all the recap of what happens on day one of practice. You'll get that here locked on Broncos every single day, all year long. We'll see you tomorrow for a brand new episode of the show.